This week, founder of InfoSec Decoded, Sam Bound, joins us to discuss how learning security should be fun. In the security news, appliances with holes, gamification and its pitfalls, false rocket sirens, PHP strikes again, new laws we may actually agree with, hacking jacuzzis, ice fall in the state of ICS security, Adobe is blocking antivirus, mega is mega insecure, micro corruption CTF, and DIY NSA playset. All that and more on this episode of Paul's Security Weekly. This is Security Weekly for security professionals by security professionals. Broadcasting live from G Unit Studios in Rhode Island, it's the show where exploits run wild, packets aren't the only things getting sniffed, and the cocktails flow steady. It's Paul's Security Weekly. If your websites conduct transactions or collect sensitive data, you have a material risk on your hands that could cost millions. The client-side security gap is being exploited daily with attacks like digital skimming, credential harvesting, and form jacking. 98% of sites use first and third-party JavaScript to power and enhance the user experience, opening up the client side to the adversary. Unlike most things in security, there is an easy fix. Start by understanding your risk. Let Source Defense give you a site-wide risk report this week. Visit securityweekly.com forward slash source defense. Welcome to Paul Security Weekly. It's episode number 745, recorded on June 22nd, 2022. 2022. Right here in G Unit Studios in Rhode Island. On the lines or remotely, Mr. Josh Marpet is with us. What's up, Josh? Last I checked, I'm here, although I'm, again, on the jankiest setup in the world because I'm in the middle of moving. My apologies. Yeah, you, do, you went to your, your new, well, your I guess your new house where it's not fully set up yet because you're like... I have more crap and more bins than I know what to do with, so yes. no, it's not fully set up yet. Yes. Well, I'm glad you're able to join us this evening. Mr. Tyler Robinson, one of the coolest shirts ever, is here with us. What's up, man? What's going on, man? Thanks. Well, you know, another fantastic day. Wednesday. Another day in paradise. Uh, if you have a specific guest or topic you'd like us to cover in one of the upcoming shows, you know what? You can do that. You can go to securityweekly.com forward slash guests. Complete that form. We review those suggestions pretty much every week, except we didn't this week. But usually every week we review them. So make sure you do that. Jumping right into it. Joining us today, Sam Bound, the founder of InfoSec Decoded. Sam has given talks and hands-on training at DEF CON, Black Hat, Hope, Besides San Francisco, besides Las Vegas, RSA, many other conferences and colleges. He also provides corporate training and consulting for several Fortune 100 companies on topics including incident response and secure coding. Sam, welcome to the show. Thank you. I'm glad to be here. <laughs> it's good to have you here, man. Um, I, you supported us like on social media and stuff. My voice is also cracking tonight. I apologize. Some allergy things going on, but... Uh, I, no, I recognize be honest, second puberty, come on. <clears throat> or that, I, that's the thing. But Sam, you supported us on social media, I recognize your name, and we, we looked you up, and we found you, and we dragged you on the show, so welcome. Oh, yeah. Well, this show has been famous forever. Well, One of the standards. You. Yes, thank you for listening. Uh, and yeah. now you get to be on the show, and we get to pick your brain on all kinds of things. My first question is pretty easy, though. How'd you get your start on information security, Sam? Oh, by just wandering from one thing to another. I mean, I started in physics and I did cryogenic studies of molecular tunneling in proteins. And then I moved over Wait, to whoa, uh, human. What, what cryogenic? What yeah. now? We took proteins. Now I'm interested. <laughs> you take my <myoglobin, laughs> really cold stuff. Uh, you took some. Yeah, you take my. You take sperm whale myoglobin, and when you bind a carbon dioxide to it, it turns red. And when you knock it off with the laser, it turns blue. And this is important because the same thing happens in your muscles hmm. and to, and something similar happens in your blood. So we cooled it down near to absolute zero and watched that process when we could slow it down. And we proved the entire carbon monoxide molecule tunnels, which was the first time a molecule had ever been observed to tunnel. And what, what do you mean by tunneling a molecule? Uh, quantum, quantum mechanical tunnel. tunneling. Hmm. It's um, where you don't have enough energy to climb th over a barrier so you just pass through it because of the uncertainty in your position. You're talking it's about quantum tunneling. That's it, quantum tunneling. That's amazing. 
That's cool, yeah, yeah. man. We need to talk about that sometime. I know, I've been right? That sounds like way more fun than cybersecurity stuff right now. <laughs> yeah, and, and it all came back because now we have quantum computing, you know, which is relying on understanding quantum mechanics. So that's what my thesis was in. Nice. Yeah, was it the UK was in the news this week for buying a quantum computer? Is that did I read that right? I don't know, but there's a bunch of people doing it. Mm. China's developing, everyone's developing it, and several people are beginning to make claims that it's actually faster than a classical computer under certain esoteric circumstances mm. but it's not remotely uh, useful for cracking real cryptography yet or anything yet is the operative word there <clears throat> but anyway after i was done yeah. with that physics stuff i moved over to computer brain modeling and studying human vision and then i moved into finance and uh ended up uh when i started back going back to teach college i was teaching ordinary microsoft office and programming and such and then i started hearing about all the exciting hacking going on mm. And uh, I decided to try teaching hacking at college, and that worked mostly because I have no administration at my college, so there was nobody to notice or say no. So. <laughs> Sounds like a good college to be teaching at, actually. <laughs> it is. It is. Our, our We had a, a chancellor for several years, but he had to flee uh, paging seven felony indictments. So after that, there was an endless chain of temps <laughs> at the college, and that meant nobody was watching what I was doing. So I figured I could get away with teaching hacking, and it turned out to be true. That's awesome. Then, so where do you teach, Sam? Oh, City College, San Francisco. Nice. That's awesome. A, a, and, and a how, famous how and long, notorious institution. How yeah. long have you been teaching hacking and cybersecurity? Uh, 10 years, maybe 12. <clears throat> nice. I've been teaching general IT for maybe 20, 22 years, but uh, I started teaching security a little bit later. And is there a degree program now for it? Uh, there's a two-year degree. That's what we have. Yeah, there's a couple two-year degrees in security and advanced cybersecurity. And I got a whole bunch of courses, like 12 or 14 security courses, all more or less like SANS courses, only cheaper. Yeah. Because you said it was a, a city college, so you can go get your associate's degree probably pretty cheap? Yes, for free now. They've lowered and, the price so, all the way to zero. It was California. never very far above zero, yeah. but now it's zero. <laughs> so California pays for you to go to community college and get a two-year associate's degree in cybersecurity. Mm -hmm. Yeah, San Francisco does, yeah. <clears throat> Same thing here in Rhode Island. You can go get a cybersecurity at Community College of Rhode Island, and the state pays for it. Well, that's nice of them. I mean, the price was so low, I'm not sure it really matters. But anyway, yeah. they did that. Yeah. But I think that's great. I, I just I want to encourage that to our audience and have our audience encourage others to like do that because I, I don't, to, we need people in cybersecurity. If you got a two-year degree, that's awesome. If you don't have a degree and you know your stuff, that's cool too. But I think it's... Uh, lower the barrier to entry, right? I mean, if you know your stuff and you got a degree and you didn't pay a lot for it, I mean, you're smart. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I especially like the fact that nobody has to go into debt mm. at our community college. I feel really bad for people that build up fifty and hundred grand in student loans. Yeah, I mean, for certain well, those... for certain professions, you know, that that's a thing. Lawyers, doctors, but for nursing doctors. and law, I guess you have to, but yeah. not in this field, right? So what, what kind of things do you, do you teach? Oh, um, you know, the usual stuff, forensics, uh, instant response, exploit development, uh, malware analysis, uh, management stuff like CISSP and mm -hmm. CISM. You know, like I say, pretty much the same kind of stuff you'd find at SANS or anywhere else. Right. And you teach some uh, encryption stuff too, right? Yes, I'm very happy with that. I taught a cryptography class for several years. And now I've added a whole bunch of cryptocurrency to it, mm. which is, of course, the new thing. And it really should split into two or three classes. It's getting pretty big. Because cryptocurrency is madness. I mean, there are hundreds of exciting developments all the time. It is an exciting space. Tyler plays a lot in that in that space. Plays a lot. That's kind of a relative term. Mm. But yeah. That's awesome. But I do think Very we need to get we need to get a lot of a lot more interest kind of going around uh, a lot of the web 3.0 decentralization blockchain even down to some of the the cryptologist stuff that is kind of a lost art all that is starting to play back into what's coming down the pipe with smart contracts uh, the different crypto exchanges all of those are are relevant and as much as people 
hate to admit it, it is uh, here and present. So starting to see some of that get integrated into the security programs within inside of some of the colleges and at least an awareness around some of that, I think is going to become even, even more critical. We're already behind in security, but now we're talking about being behind in security for financial things uh, that are already being implemented and used by many of the banks and organizations today. Yeah, that's what got me really pretty upset about it, because I used to work at a financial institution, and I was horrified when this poorly written, crappy code, halfway thought through, hardly even a beta version, and people are throwing millions, hundreds of millions of dollars into this stuff, when it's really not ready at all. That just described every new altcoin or crypto blockchain that's out there right now, like... There's I know. millions and millions of dollars going around and people are putting, you know, life savings into it because they hear a tip and, you know, it's get in early and get started. But you look at any of these smart contracts and, and some of the breaches on the exchanges, it's ridiculous the kind of vulnerabilities that are being disclosed and discovered uh, and then grossly abused for millions of dollars very, very easily by attackers. Yeah. And really, as I think is almost always the case, most of the vulnerabilities are not technical. They just involve trusting somebody and he just steals your money. So it is funny. We've gotten back to that point where many of these cryptos are on like Discord servers and the advice that gets offered or some social engineering attack happens. Uh, and these people are trying to get support on their wallet. They can't access something. And uh, lo and behold, they get social engineered. This is, goes back to like the BBS days or, or the old <laughs> forum days when you just get social engineered out of a password or an account. Like, yeah, I was catching uh, up with Joe. How Grant. we back to that? I was catching up with Joe Grand, and he's got like a whole company now where he's helping people get back into their wallets that have lost access based on the um, the hack that he did against one. Yeah, of the I saw one of his videos wallets. hacking into a. a <clears throat> hardware wallet and it was very nice yeah he actually flew the guy whose wallet it was and like a film crew to his house to do the hack lot because i was like wait a minute did you you had like other of the exact same kind of crypto hardware wallets he's like yeah i, I practiced first and then when they did the actual attack and some people in the comments were saying like it's fake He's like, no, dude, that's not fake. That's like we actually well, definitely, yeah. definitely not fake. There was a vulnerability in in the code uh, that allowed him to do it, which you know he's very very clear about. Hey, this is he, was an older version. It was a, a fault fault injection. Yeah, power yeah. fault. Yeah, power, power fault. fault. Yeah, it was a power fault injection. Right. It, it was power glitching, wasn't it? Right. With a special gadget. Power glitching as a technique. Glitch. Yeah, which, I mean, basically means that at some point in the processing, you introduce basically a brownout usually right right that when it's about to make the decision like hey should i let you in should i not let you in in that decision point you're like brown well no actually but the, the issue was that it copied the encryption key into insecure memory briefly and you had to glitch it at that point uh, and then you'd find the key in the in memory you memory. could access right which that code was fixed very very readily by by treasure that was you know a well-known uh, security vulnerability that was, you know, a commit with inside their GitHub repo. It's all open source, which is how he was able to find that breakpoint and find that vulnerability based on the version that was available. Right. But yeah. kudos to him for doing it. I mean, it's still very cool. Oh, yeah. And, I was very and interested to see the real technique of hardware hacking. That is a real hardware hacking to absolutely agree. And Joe Grand, I mean, you know, yeah. hardware hacking, it's kind of his thing. And power glitching has been around for quite a while. I it mean, it's, it's also part of the idea that if you've got a one or a zero, it's a volt. It's a voltage differential between the one and the zero. If you're not feeding it enough juice to make that voltage differential, it's still going to try to send a signal, but it's going to send yeah. effectively. It's going to be hard to interpret that signal, so it'll send the wrong signal. Yeah, and I remember the RSA hack from about ten years ago, where they would just underpower a processor, so it makes mistakes when calculating the RSA encryption, and by analyzing a hundred defective encryptions, you can deduce the key. That one's fascinating still. I think that's one of the the best modern uh, cryptological attacks that you know people just don't understand from the hardware level what what we're relying on uh, and some of the vulnerabilities. Like there's just not enough testers out there. Joe Grant is like you know a unicorn in our in our field, and there's not that many people that understand it at his level in order to do the testing for all these companies putting out all these blinky lights and secure devices that uh, we're relying on for some very important secrets. Yeah. While we're on the topic, uh, just full disclosure and kind of a sneak preview for our audience. Uh, Joe Grant and I spent about two hours today doing a podcast uh, together, uh, which I thank Joe for. It's amazing. He, he 
put the time in to you know, set aside time to do that. Uh, and it'll be released in an upcoming Hacker Heroes episode. We're getting ready to release that show. We've got quite a few episodes in the can. So, oh, uh, you did a Joe Grand episode for Hacker Heroes? That's going to be two, awesome, dude. Joe and I hung out for two hours, dude. We I didn't know you did that. Talking. Now I'm jealous. Yeah, it was awesome. It was awesome. I know. I'm like, everyone's going to be jealous that <laughs> I got that much time with Joe to just sit and shoot the shit. One thing he did say, um, tomorrow he's releasing a new video on his YouTube channel. He wouldn't tell me what it's about, but it's releasing a new video. So like, make sure you check. If you're listening to this afterwards, like, go find Joe's uh, YouTube channel <clears throat> and check it out. Yeah, you know, that, that this hardware vulnerability reminds me. There, you know, that mathematics is often beautiful and perfect, but when you actually build devices, you introduce vulnerabilities. And I remember when I was a grad student in physics, I blew up a whole bank of capacitors because I was trying to tune a laser and I kept charging it and flashing it over and over. And the whole bank of capacitors blew up. And one of the more experienced students said, you didn't let it cool. And I said, why no? Capacitors do not heat up. They don't dissipate any energy because the current and voltage are 90 mm -hmm. degrees out of phase. And he said, you idiot. It's not a perfect capacitor. It leaks. Mm. And I hadn't thought of that. Mm. Oh, oh, I've got a saying for this. I've got a saying for this. In theory, theory and practice are the same. Right. In practice, not so much. Yes. Yes. That's a, that's a beautiful shirt. But Sam, uh, you and I were talking about the, the Hertz bleed attack. Yeah. And this is the Hertz a, bleed. a side channel power analysis style attack. But yep. there was something significant that I couldn't remember when I was talking to Joe earlier. In 1996, we thought we had this problem solved. Were you familiar, were you familiar yeah, with Yeah, timing that? attacks. The timing attacks. Yeah. That's when timing attacks first became known. Okay. But where we you had time some... the uh, time expended to encrypt and decrypt things, and from that you can deduce information about the key. Mm. And so they had to write code that takes a constant amount of time, and that's the defense against it. And the problem with Hertz bleed is it defeats that. Oh, Right. Because, By is that because into, the, entropy, the entropy is able to be deduced from the timing? No, because it's able to use speculative execution to look a few instructions ahead. Uh. And, and it's able to use that information to learn which branch you were taking in the code, I think, the same way you could have from a timing attack. That's really interesting. So these tie into the spectra and branch prediction attacks. I think so. I mean, it's, it's, it's like spectra and meltdown mm -hmm. in that regard. And and also extremely impractical and difficult to accomplish. You know, it's a, a sort of theoretical vulnerability, sure. but you know, do Spectre highly, meltdown you know, fall in that category for you too, Sam? Well, they. I think there were a few actual real practical exploits demonstrated, mm -hmm. where you could steal a password out of a browser. So they weren't that uh, that esoteric after a while. Gotcha. I mean, the main I know, the thing I know about them is when patching was very expensive. It slowed down cloud machines by about a factor of two. That's yeah. a big factor. Have they fixed See, they, that? I haven't caught up with... No. No, they, they can't fix it. Not until they have a whole new generation of hardware. All they can do is like put a patch in front of it to block the known attack. So Basically they keep finding WAF. new attacks. It's, it's a worldwide WAF, effectively. Yep. Instead of a worldwide web, it's a worldwide WAF. <laughs> it is, and there's like a dozen more variants that keep punching through the existing defenses. And it, are they all basically are dealing with branch prediction and being able to right. exploit that? Yeah, remember when I very first learned this about 20 years ago, they said, you know, the, the uh, processor is pipelined. It's been doing 20 instructions at the same time. It begins the, the first in, next instruction before it finishes the first one. And right. I said, that sounds insane. And I still feel like that. It is, of course, kind of insane. I remember my computer science uh, professor drawing on a chalkboard when I was in college <laughs> talking about yeah. branch prediction and when Spectre of Meltdown started coming out I'm like oh wait I remember learning that in school <laughs> yeah it just doesn't seem like that could possibly be a good idea mm. and in a way it isn't mm. and, and patching it's super hard I mean you have to apply the micro code update to the CPU I want to say preface that with sometimes it comes down in a firmware update but not always right you know yeah. if only there was this company that could do firmware security well i just wish there was one or two of those we, we can and if the microcode updates are in firmware we can certainly tell you that whether you've applied the update or not for those that maybe didn't tune last i work for a company called eclipsium and we do firmware security and it's super i'm super nerding out on all on all this stuff 
and, and that question did come up um, at, at now my now day job, right? It was like, because I'm sure a lot of people were asking like, hey, can we apply? Because we talked about a lot of process of vulnerabilities last week. Um, <clears throat> so yeah, if it comes down in the firmware. I'm curious, like from from your standpoint, I, I really want to hear your kind of life mantra. You've been in multiple verticals, multiple industries. You've obviously done this for quite a while. The uh, the mantra of always learning how to learn and that continual passion for learning, like what is it that, that drives you and like how do you kind of instill that in the next generation? I feel like we've kind of got a, a loss gap of that. Uh, desire to always be continually learning and, and finding that passion to be excited about learning. Oh, well, well, it, it's just what you think it is. I mean, I'm ideal to support my habit. I'm a teacher, so as an excuse for being a student forever. And the, uh, <laughs> but I, <laughs> so many you know, of I, those. what's that? There's so many of those. Yeah. Yeah. And you know, this is what drew me into this business. I heard about DEF CON and I went there and I said, this is incredible thousands of people doing awesome things and they're so motivated that even though they aren't even getting paid and are even being threatened with jail time they're developing all this awesome stuff and i said i want to capture that enthusiasm for my classes so i mean if you do it right students are having fun learning stuff i always liked my math and physics courses they were like a fun little puzzle you'd learn a trick and then you do the problems and um and so i i try to explain it clearly enough to my students so they can do that and it works pretty much. I mean, that's why I went to DEF CON and learned about CTFs and I restructured my classes to be like CTFs, which is extremely useful because all my classes have nice. a mixture of people at different skill levels. There's complete beginners that can barely do anything. And then there's experienced hobbyists and professionals that already know half the material. And if you structure it as a CTF, then everybody can move up to the right level. That is one of the big benefits of gamification. Yeah. And, and also the other thing is my, most ETFs in the industry are way too hard. They're, they're, the beginners can't do anything. And so I make mine very easy. There's an easy thing with complete step-by-step -step to do it mm -hmm. and then harder challenges without instructions. So even a complete beginner can do the easy ones. Yeah. I, I, I really do like that, that model, right? I think we tend to focus a little too much on gamification as we progress in our careers as a teaching and learning tool. I covered in one of my stories, someone wrote an article like gamification is awesome. We should use it everywhere and all the time. I'm like, yeah, but like first it's not real world, right? And so like once you've gone through the first beginning stages of learning this stuff, you've taken Sam's classes, right? You're, you're in the field. Like you need real world experience. CTFs are a great way to give you those experience yeah. leading up to that, right? But it's not a replacement for that. Also, I feel like once you're like into your career and you're learning, gamification like you're just sometimes focused on playing the game and scoring points yeah. and winning rather than the learning aspect right like if there's i mean sure a shortcut or a hack like that's great but like now you've just kind of skipped over some of those steps that you normally would have gone through to, to get there and those are important for learning yes that's why i notice people tend to focus on competing too much mm. for example our students get in the ccdc and cptc and they're just all focused on winning and i tell them you know every one of the students that gets on the competition team gets a good job out of it they it doesn't do. really matter yep. whether you win yep. the only thing winning does is promote the college yep. but the students have already won by being on the team at all yep the bravo what like, a great attitude yeah. i love that that's do you awesome feel, do you feel the team for uh, the ccdc competition yeah we did ccdc mostly we do cptc what and that? we didn't do it last year but we're going to do it again next year what's cptc it's pen testing. It's the red team version of CCDC. Oh, interesting. Not affiliated with CCDC or? No, but it's it's like a spinoff. Uh, oh, okay. Call it Collegiate Penetration Testing Championship. Oh, I didn't and know And it's that actually existed. really nice. They have a vulnerable company. You have to submit a proposal mm -hmm. and get approved. And then you have to do a controlled pen test with all the rules and limitations. Mm -hmm. And then you have to present your results to the company. That's amazing. Nice. So it really do, do you go the against the blue team? There is. They are the blue team. You're oh, you're just a pen test consultancy. Are there actual people detecting and blocking attacks? Um, there's a whole bunch of teams, like at CCDC. There's a whole mm. bunch of people in the background, um, throwing in extra challenges, monitoring what they do. Okay. Calling them with like requests. 
they even had one time they even had a guy that would like wander in and try to trick you into doing something stupid mm. and you had to have enough sense not to listen to him i got you, you. Know? that's awesome that is awesome um uh, that's really cool we should actually have somebody from cptc on the show that would we be should. fun i agree yeah uh, they're very good uh, but- people I've got a question for you. Do you know uh, 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 Eric Arnoff, Dichotomy? They run the Pros v. Joe's. He runs the Pros v. Joe's CTF. I think I met him, and I went to Pros v. Joe's one time. Yeah. You should talk to him. He's developed it so far out there that it's. I think you would you would enjoy using his system. Yeah, it very could very well be. I'm very impressed with the training platforms out there. I've been retiring uh, some of the ones I made and just switching to the ones other people have because they're getting so good. Like the Web Security Academy is really awesome. Spins up a VM separate for every student so they can practice all the web attacks. It's very nice. That sounds like a pen test academy is, is amazing for that. And there's another I was gonna say, similar to that. Yeah. Uh, pen test academy is really, really good from a lab standpoint. They've, I mean, he's been developing that since, man, early 2000s. I remember some of his yeah. early content. Not as good as his new content. Yeah. Yeah. But Web Security Academy is free, which is real important for me at my very cheap college. <laughs> yes. those are good resources are, for students so those are hard to find the, the free ones or at least you know on a on a very limited budget uh labs for for students because that's a hard to recommend you know seven eight hundred dollars a year for for a college student is you know cost of books for some places so that's uh that's a, yeah. a really important aspect yeah that's why i run half a dozen vulnerable servers and they're always getting hacked and messed up and i just repair them enough to keep them going you know I keep getting uh, vulnerability reports from people saying they found vulnerabilities on my deliberately vulnerable servers, yeah. and they want me to patch it, but I'm not going to patch it. Yeah, pay out that back bug bounty for them. <laughs> yeah. yeah, I don't have any bug bounties, but I do have a uh, uh, disclosure policy saying I won't punish anybody for telling me things if they obey the rules, you know. Especially if they disclose those O-days. Those are always nice to have a, a look at well a bunch of my stuff has been hacked almost everything some students found ways to cheat on my ctf two or three times they've they found vulnerabilities and hacked my various servers many times so i put them on a hall of fame oh that's awesome i think that's perfect. one of the best ones was a student snuck i used to log into my laptop in the classroom and a student just snuck behind me with a cell phone and recorded me typing in a password that was a good one mm-hmm. and hard to protect myself against that's amazing those are those are kids you want to hire <laughs> Right. Yes. Oh, yes. One of my most dangerous students just got a, a whole bunch of really high powered jobs. And uh, that student has stolen all my passwords more than once. <laughs> so I, when we when COVID came and I was talking to my sister, she said, maybe we're all going to die. You should write a will. One of my friends said, who would maintain your website? And I said, well, that student has all my passwords. Right. You can go. Just yeah. ask <laughs> it. See, you're the professor I wish I had. Like, where were you all my life? Right. <laughs> I know the students were really excited by this when I say, uh, go ahead and hack me. I mean, I was teaching my first advanced hacking class and I was lecturing on something like SQL injection and two students were muttering in the back, sort of being noisy and irritating me. And they didn't shut up and they were getting more and more loud. And, and I was just about to yell at them and tell them to be quiet when they jumped up and said, yes, we just hacked your website. <laughs> and I said, well, uh, let's abandon the rest of the lecture. They're more on topic than anybody. Show me how you did it. <laughs> That's amazing. <laughs> I had included like slash dot headlines in my website by just copying somebody else's code without reading it. Mm. And it had a vulnerability. Oh. It was awesome. It was totally legit, right? I had a vuln, they got in. It was great. So That's Sam, I'm going to I'm going to play devil's advocate for a second. Yeah. Uh, I've taught college at several different universities. Uh, I'm very proud of what I did. I even if they handed me a curricula and lesson plans, I always made sure that the students learned at least you know, my, my, my thing was they've got to learn at least one useful thing. I've taught like yeah. the Security Plus prep course, for example. You still had to understand what uh, asymmetric cryptography was. You still had to create your own keys. You had to send me an email that you encrypted with your with my with my public key. It's, you, you know the routine. That's great. And um, so at the very least, they learned one useful bloody thing or, or concept. But most of the time, the teachers that they would have in this world that is moving mostly to adjuncts, they got people that read off the cue cards effectively. They read up. They they, they read the powerpoints, and that's all they do. Yeah, um, I know, and that's that's miserable. It is. It is. It is. So, what do we do about that? Well, um, 
I think it is being fixed the same way things like banking and taxi cabs are being fixed by disruptive entrant. Um, I think an increasing number of people don't go to colleges. They go to like um, Google's training certificates and industry training, um, third party things like SANS. I think the old college model based on lectures and a textbook and quizzes and texts is kind of becoming obsolete and being disrupted by different ways to learn. Do you think colleges can actually catch up and and adapt or adopt a more suitable learning model for things like cybersecurity degrees where you have like governments that still require degrees and yeah, many well, of those is- are, are problematic, right? Like that doesn't really work for a lot of students that don't have a degree, didn't start in this, there wasn't a degree available or they've done the certificate route. I know. That's why um, uh, there is a college that lets you get a degree just by getting industry certificates. Um, I can't remember the name of it, but some of my uh, students went off and did that. But I mean, Western Governors Sands, Governors College. What's that? Western Governors, right? Yeah, Western Governors, yeah. Yeah, and SANS now can give you a degree. So, I mean, there are some changes coming, but I agree. And I, I've been doing this for years in a college. The college structure is really rigid and really out of date. It's like a church. They have this standard way of doing things, and they don't want to hear it if you want to rock the boat too much. So it's, uh, I think in the long run, the value of a college degree is going to go down, but we'll see. There is currently a prevalent belief that actually earning a BS degree or something demonstrates some level of maturity. And therefore, you are a better employee, even if the degree is in something completely unrelated to the field, which it almost always is in cybersecurity. I wonder if that's really true. In particular, I would really like to think that military service should count as just as much maturity as any college degree. But I think I would say, I would say the- even more, right? Like if you're going for maturity, discipline, the ability to follow orders, like from a employment standpoint, military would make a lot of sense. College, it shows me you can go to class maybe hungover you can get into debt and you know you probably had some good parties like yeah there's some level of finishing stuff but at the cost of a lot of things that aren't worth that just to get a job in my opinion oh i tend to agree with you i think um college especially in an exciting field like cybersecurity, most of the time you're wasting your time my students are very frustrated they can't get a four-year degree in cybersecurity. they would have to get a four-year degree in something like computer science that would mostly be like operating system design and coding, which is not what they're interested in and not what they're going to do. So it's uh, it is a common frustration. The biggest the biggest advice I, I usually give to people that have to get those degrees, honestly, if if I could recommend or go back and do it myself, I would be all over getting a business degree, getting a communications degree, social media, uh, technical writing, the ability to Bingo. effectively communicate technically write something, understand business and the business lingo and, and return on investment, how businesses are structured, that's taken several decades to learn. And that is the differentiator between me and you know many people in the field. Those are huge benefits and those are untangibles that you just can't actually get outside of a, a degree unless you've learned it the hard way. You know, I, I really... Yeah, go ahead. Go ahead, go ahead, Sam. Go ahead, Sam. Yeah, I really agree with that. And it reminds me of something. I see so many people in the field, they, they get some kind of reputation in security, and then they start their own consultancy, and they run alone. And they almost always fail for the same reason. You need two people. You need someone who runs the business to handle the taxes and the payroll and negotiating with the clients and all that. And usually the technical person is not the right personality for that. I see far too many technical people try to be the business manager and they're not suited for it. I know I am not. I've learned not to talk to clients. I will always say the wrong thing. I can't get on their wavelength. Yeah, I think and, you, and you even hire, if you are you hire for your deficiencies which you can do yeah. in your career. Unfortunately at home it's more difficult, but <laughs> Yeah, well, I'm I'm not alone in my company. There's there's I have a partner who handles the business negotiation stuff. Mm. And I'm amazed. He knows just what to say to those people. And whenever they talk to me, I end up saying the wrong thing. You know? uh, back to college, though, like I think college is what you make of it. I think also like training and learning is what you make of it as well. Yeah. Because like I think a lot of people can sit through class 
and get a passing grade and not really like absorb anything or fully engross themselves in the subjects. I think training and, and learning that we do today in your career is the same kind of thing. You can go get the piece of paper. Does that really mean that you're passionate about it and you know the stuff and you're really engrossed in it? No. So I think the advice for those listening and advice to pass along to others, right, is make something of your college experience, whatever it is, whether it's yeah. whether it's training and you're not going for any kind of degree or whether it's a two-year degree, four-year, whatever, whatever it is, make the most out of it. If you got Sam right. as a professor, hey, what can I do to help you with the labs, right? I minored mm. in environmental science, not because yeah. I was so much interested in geology and the sciences behind it, although it turned out to be fascinating, but they, they needed help with their computer systems. And I was the go-to tech guy. So I got to do things like travel to Belize, which was an amazing experience and use like one of the first digital cameras to ever come out on the market that Sony gave to our program, which is awesome. Nice. It took, <laughs> floppy, yeah. it took floppy disks for those. That, That's the Mavica. Yeah. It's, I had floppies in it and it took digital photographs and saved them to a floppy disk inside the camera. Yeah, what Paul isn't telling you is that it took eight inch floppies, and this was in 1962. No, no, there were three and a half inch floppies. <laughs> I was going to say, those were hard floppies for that one. Mm -hmm. Then they had oh, the sure upgraded one hard. that had the, the cartridge floppies <clears throat> and then the zip drive one. Oh, dear Lord. But Sam, I think I, I, I'm going to throw my philosophy out here. And I, I, I think that you're right. Uh, and, and Paul, I agree with, I actually, I agree with all of you. College is what you make of it. But in this case, in this field, you have to research the professors. It's the professors that make the difference. Yeah, that's it's good not advice. the, it's not the uh, uh, you know the prestige of the college or the cachet of the program. It's the professors that make the difference. Are they involving you in the CTFs? Are they giving talks outside of the college to to show that they're knowledge, they're doing research and that their knowledge is expanding and that they're researching what's actually happening? You know, they're not teaching Fortran. Okay, for example, uh, or Fortran is are, awesome. I'll have you know. Yeah, but, well, it, but, it's not, but it's not about like what they're teaching. It's how not even how they're teaching. It's how they're interacting with students. And the other reason, primary reason I, I monitor environmental science is because one of the professors was just awesome and was amazing at um, not just teaching, but encouraging all the students to, to be something that you may not have seen in yourself. Right. Uh, and, and that's a quality of a great professor. So, Josh, your point is spot on. Yeah, well, but, you have I mean, to get them also, interested. Okay, the, That's why I like DEF CON and all the other conferences. People are so excited. They go there and do it for fun. That's the attitude I want. Right. You have to love what you're doing. And by the way, if you're going to bring up Fortran. I'm going to say I'm teaching COBOL on Friday. I made a COBOL CTF. And how, some how, do, people, how, do we get, how do we get involved in that? I want in. <laughs> it's, it's on my website. Anybody can join. I did it at uh, GrimCon. I proposed it to DEF CON and they said, are you nuts? Nobody wants to learn COBOL. And I said, you might be surprised, but they didn't yeah, approve nuts. it. That might be fun. That might be fun. Take some it is. Us, COBOL is very interesting. Some of Sam, us older. what's your website? Yeah, some of Sam's us older. Class info. Sam's class dot info. Yeah. Some of us have never done COBOL. COBOL I and know. Fortran right now, like there's a reason that, that those guys make $800 an hour and are some of the most demanded resources. There are mainframes all over the world that still run very critical things, and there's very few people doing security assessments against them, much less even knowing how they work. So you can do whatever you want if you understand those mainframes and can interact with them. All the better if you can do the security side of it. Yeah, and this only does the basics. All my stuff is really only beginning stuff, but still, I was very pleased to learn some COBOL. It's as old as I am. It's from 1959. Oh, my God. That's amazing. I didn't know. Yeah, no, but seriously, I've talked to multiple to banks in the past two or three years that are still running mainframes. 95% of all financial transactions still go through COBOL. It's, there's actually at least two banks that I know of that have hired young people, 18 to 25, somewhere in there, who have college degrees to follow around their COBOL guy because they only have one yeah. left. And they yeah. promised this this young person a quarter million dollars a year for the rest of their life if they can learn COBOL enough to maintain the mainframe. Absolutely. It's it's much more interesting than people would think. <laughs> yeah, yeah, because it, it got a, I think it just got yeah. a bad reputation, right? Because it was still like Y2K was when people were like hiring COBOL programmers because they wanted to update their code and it, it got really popular. But also around that time is when the internet and the web was ramping up 
and everyone was like, I got to learn this Java thing. I got to learn C++. Yeah. I got to learn these sexier languages other than COBOL. Like COBOL was for like Wait, old, you mean old like people. you mean like today? You got Django, you got like RabbitHQ, you got all the the hipster new uh, dev bro languages and and a lot of the older stuff even C is is less sexy, less popular. You got to learn, you know, JavaScript. <laughs> right. Yeah. And then there's Solidity, which is really a train wreck. But anyway, <laughs> Stop talking blockchain. Um, <laughs> so many languages. But I, I think the, the COBOL CTF sounds pretty fun, actually. I had a lot of fun, and a lot of people did. <laughs> yeah. That's cool. That's really cool, man. I, I'm, I'm kind of impressed with that. Um, I will point out that, you know, besides the, the teaching, the, the, the teachers, the classes, and the end goal is that it depends on the job you want as well. There's a lot of jobs that a college degree is just not something they care about. Yeah. So sure. you have to really have a strategy depending on where you want to go. Um, as well, anybody in InfoSec, if you go into an interview with a company that you really want, you better be able to answer the question, what are you researching now? Yeah, and you often ought to tell them about your home lab. Oh, yeah. Whether it's in AWS or in your living room, you better be able to tell them. And by the way, you said you've got to research professors. I just want to mention Rate My Professor. That's the website for it. Hmm. It's Yelp for professors. I highly recommend it. Sam, your, classes, for professors. your classes are open to anyone? Yeah, yeah. See, I, I did that. That's another one of the rules I broke. Um, about four years ago, our CTF team was getting ready to do like the big competitions, and I needed to teach exploit development, and they promised me they would add it to the schedule, and they never did it. So I said, well, I need to teach it anyway, so it's not an official class. I'm going to come in on Saturday and just teach it. And since it's not an official class, I'll just let the whole world in. And I've been letting the whole world into all my classes for free ever since then. It turns out to be fine. There's not an overwhelming number of people that want to take this stuff, but I got people coming in from all over the nations and everything. Yeah, that doesn't amazing. matter. Anybody can join. You don't get, of course, official college credit unless right. you officially enroll at the college. Right. But uh but you can take the class from anywhere. That's awesome. So yeah, me, a lot of people about, like it because there's no good security classes, you know, in their town or in their country. So they're glad to take something. Tell me about teaching exploit development. How'd you structure the class? Well, you know, I was very pleased to do it. It took me a couple of years. I read like gray hat hacking and stuff, and I would try to make a buffer overflow and it wouldn't work because all the researchers, all the books I could find skipped about half the steps, yeah. which is true of about everything. And they're they used older, to, older operating systems before they that's had right. memory protection. <laughs> of some that's right. So when I would try to do it on a modern operating system, nothing would work and I wouldn't know why, but until I finally found Georgia Weedman's book, mm. or, or a beginning hacking book, there's an appendix in the back where she takes you from zero up through a working buffer overflow and it works. Wow. That was finally the breakthrough for me. So after I got that working, I then... Uh, went through the the main bible of this which is you know um shell code the mm -hmm. shell coder's handbook shell coder's handbook yep great book yep and i that was hard to, book is very complicated and hard mm -hmm. to read and very dense so as is i usually dave, do i picked through Vitell? i picked the easy parts out was dave, dave i think Vitell? it is dave, Vitell. dave Vitell i think is it one is of the, yeah. one of the authors the primary author i think yeah i think it's his book like yeah. oh it's very very complete it's, it's very complete but it's very advanced and so I, anyway, also, I just uh, based sorry, it on that quick, book quick side and I wrote note. a bunch of hands-on projects so students could learn it. Quick side note, I also spent over an hour and a half with Dave Vitell for Hacker Heroes as well. So. Oh, you suck. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah, yeah. You suck. But anyway, wow. one thing. Wow, scum bastard, and you didn't invite us to stop by and say hello. I'm going to have to start scum. inviting you guys to Hacker Heroes, though. Yeah, I think that's going to have to be a thing. Mm -hmm. But I'll tell you one Sorry, thing Sam, funny about that exploit development course. I went to China, DEF CON China, mm. and um, they were wandering around saying, hey, we need another talk for the blue team. And I said, hey, I could teach encryption. And they said, oh, no, due to export restrictions, it's yeah. illegal for you to teach encryption in China. Not and in I China. said, but this isn't like classified stuff. It's like RSA and AES. It's That's plain ordinary illegal. encryption. And they said, it doesn't matter. You can't teach it. So instead, I taught exploit development. And I said, well, I'm not sure this makes any sense at all, <laughs> but that's what I did because that was legal. That's really funny. Yeah. Yeah. The RSA algorithms, except in very, very crippled ones are, uh, ITAR 
ITAR controlled, yeah, because they're dual use, technically. Yeah, and they, I looked at the list. There's a list of nations you cannot export cryptography to or teach there, and China's on that list. So they weren't kidding. So I didn't teach my crypto workshop there. So just the, by the way, just the fact that you had the slides on your laptop means that you're a felon, self-admitted. But but I didn't have the slides on my laptop. I never use slides. Everything's just on my website. So okay, there. Okay. All right. Well done, sir. <laughs> well, I sneak by on a technicality. So I just, back to exploit development. Is it uh, what languages work? You work in C to write the. Yeah, it's mostly C. I mean, C and Windows, of course. Mm -hmm. So first, I have some uh, basic projects where they have command injection mm -hmm. and SQL injection, things like that. And then they write C programs and compile them and exploit them and hack into various servers that are running vulnerable programs. And then we do Windows, and they do the famous Windows exploits, mm -hmm. uh, attacking vulnerable software on Windows. That's awesome. Yeah, yeah, they do the usual stuff, buffer overflows, format string vulnerabilities, um, heap overflows, that kind of thing. What's your but favorite it, course to teach, Sam? Well, I kind of like them all, really. I, um, I wouldn't do them otherwise. Uh, even the yeah, management ones I've gotten more interested in. Um, um, they, I taught Security Plus for a long time, and I thought that was very good. You know, they, they each have their charms. Okay, okay. Very, very diplomatic answer, sir. Well done. No, but I mean, I'm not <laughs> lying. I mean, I, I read them myself. I write all the projects, so everything is the way I want it, you know? <laughs> I don't. Nobody's making me do something I don't want to do. That's one good thing about a college with no management. <laughs> But I like what you said, Sam. Like, if, if I wasn't passionate about the class, I wouldn't teach it, right? Because you got yeah, yeah. really love. I mean, I teach. wrote them all. I, I I wrote every one of them, and and uh, so I put in what I thought was the cool stuff to do, and and I keep updating them. So, you know, the the exploit development and the malware analysis are probably the most difficult. I have to keep mm -hmm. updating them, but it's a very interesting challenge, and I like doing it. Not the encryption one. I bet you that one's challenging, but you don't have to update it as much. <laughs> well. On the contrary, now that I'm covering cryptocurrency, oh yes, it is a lot of requiring updates. constant updates, mm -hmm. new stuff like crazy. Mm. The classic old stuff like RSA and AES that doesn't change, but the cryptocurrency changes like every day. Yep, yeah, try every second or two. Yeah, I mean, I was surprised. I, I just added Solana projects like two weeks ago, and then huh. I just saw this monstrous disaster on Solana two days ago. Yeah. Yeah, and now, right now, miners are dumping Bitcoin as soon as they mine them to get the maximum return on it. And that, well, that they it, weirdly enough, is keep, well, because they're selling, it's keeping it's the keeping price the market down, yeah. Down, yeah. Yep. yep. Yeah, that's why, you know, what we're going through now is a really necessary wipe out of the crypto space. It's full of like 10,000 shit coins that need to die. So we really need to clean up the uh, the market. All right, Sam, make your prediction. Where will Bitcoin be when this all this whole shakedown is over? It'll keep going up. I mean, this is Bitcoin has gone down before. If you put, in my opinion, although I'm not a financial analyst, if it is true that in the long run, like ten years, Bitcoin is a sensible investment. It it, it crashes and then it comes back up. And I think Bitcoin will be fine, and I think Ethereum will be fine. I think most of the others are all going to die. Yeah, that makes sense. Mm. Tyler, you agree? Except the it really one, depends. Except the Honestly, one Tyler's working it, on. <laughs> no, I mean Bitcoin, Ethereum—they're always going to be a solid coin. That's why they're not really considered an altcoin. I think a lot of the other ones have—they're doing enough interesting things that are actually going to change the world, like what they're actually doing with the coins. That in some form or fashion they either have to be integrated into a more stable coin or they become a stable coin in order to continue the mission the missions are just too important and the innovation is too uh innovative to have some of those die uh once we see the costs and financial orgs begin to back and leverage things like uh, lightning protocols for things like games financial transactions even logons and you know FIDO2 access bits, then then we're going to start to really see some of those other ones, or at least their technologies take off. So uh, I think you're spot on. Like Ethereum and, and Bitcoin aren't going away for the next 10 years, kind of where it's at. Yeah, they kind of suck their old things, but there's so much invested into them and relying on them that they just can't die. 
Well, and Ethereum can improve. Like, I mean, I was big on the Radix project from the UK for a while because they had sharding to split up the mining among many miners to make it much more efficient and faster. And I thought that was awesome, but that project never seemed to go very far. And they just built it into Ethereum. It's part of Ethereum too. So I think it's like uh, so many things. There's innovative little startups developing things. And once they get it working, you build it into a behemoth like mm -hmm. Windows OS or something. And that's where it really uh, hits mainstream. Okay. So now let's do predictions. Where's the bottom? In this, in this current crash, what is Bitcoin and Ethereum going to end up at at the bottom? Um, I really don't know. Um, it's gone. Uh, I don't think it's at the bottom yet, but but that's 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 just a complete guessing game, and I have no uh, I have no credentials at that kind of a technical analysis. Um, if we, if, I, if we I, knew that, years ago, it, I used it, to think it would fall to zero. I no longer believe that it'll come back, but it'll fall as far as people let it fall. There's pressures. There's whales. There's people getting margin calls when it passes below twenty. There's a lot of manipulations going on, and it depends on what the federal government does. Like, they've been trying for seven times this year, they've been trying to get a Bitcoin fund approved to trade on the stock market. And when they do that, all the pension funds and government money can flow in. But so far, the SEC has blocked that. Mm. So when they permit one, that will have a sudden push up. So there's just large forces pushing it in various directions right now, and I can't say when they're going to hit. Is that just because of fear, like like in un the unknowns? Well, I think it's because, like Elizabeth Warren says, this is a ridiculous investment vehicle. It seems to be completely full of corruption and manipulation and lies, and it's unstable, and they don't really think it should be allowed on the stock exchange. It's got to overcome a bad reputation, which is pretty well deserved. Well, and as someone's pointing out in the chat that, you know, ransomware is great for cryptocurrency. So it's largely some of the sustainability is because of the criminal usage of the various mm -hmm. cryptocurrencies. Yeah, well, that's what I used to say. But I've heard studies now that say that less than 1%, I think even 0.1% of the money traded on Bitcoin and Ethereum is crime now which is less than cash and visa. So I think in the early days, maybe it was all crime, but not anymore. Now it's mostly uh, legitimate investment and such. Is that because they're using other other coins? They're spreading Because out. it's all traceable. There's you know chain yeah. analysis now. You've got all of the, the different uh, crime organizations that track and follow that. It's well known. Uh, there's just not a good way to de-anonymize and or wash that money without losing losing your ass on on the wash so really there's not a point so they've moved to altcoins that you know things like monero or even built their own exchanges you will see in some of the conti things uh, if it comes public or people actually pick up on it they were building some of their own exchanges or using their own exchanges uh, which allowed them to do things like wash money a little bit easier so well, I think it also reflects real legitimization of the industry. I think there's a whole lot of real traffic going in and out of this. People are investing and buying NFTs and trading stuff. I think there's just a lot of legitimate activity, and the crime is only a small portion of it now. Yeah, I think I think Tyler's got a point there too because of the traceability now with the major. Well, that would that would just keep you out of Bitcoin and Ethereum. You can go to right. Zcash and mm -hmm. uh, privacy coins if you want that, and mixers, and they do. Yep. But the total amount of crime is very small compared to the vast amount of uh, other transactions going through. Conti Group is starting to scare me a little bit. The more you said they're looking in their own currency, Tyler? No, that's our that's our that's old news and that's mm. done gone and been used. They've dispersed and there's other groups you should definitely worry about, but mm. yeah, you look in some of the Conti chat leaks and some of the stuff that that we dump the the Use and crime. building of their own exchange was like that was something I didn't actually think about as a, a viable like market. If you've got that much money and you're able to do it, and you've got backing by you know, potential governments or financial institutions with a lot of money, that makes a ton of sense to build your own exchange. Well, I mean, then they built Hydro, which was the black market exchange of black markets. It was the like, and mm -hmm. yeah. So if you can build your own exchange, you've basically gone legitimate. You built your own money laundering platform. Mm. Well, there's a lot of ways to launder money in crypto. It's amazing how bad people are at it. Oh, my God. They keep going. 
oh, yeah, washing the crypto is going to absolutely throw off the tracking. There's no way they can track me. No, you just infected everybody else's wallet who was in that laundry cycle with you with with uh, being tracked now. You know, sorry. Yeah, it's. Uh. Yeah, well, yeah, because I think law enforcement caught on right with some help, but yeah. law enforcement definitely came up to speed. And there's a bunch of third party companies that just specialize in this like chain analysis. Yeah. Yeah. Um, it's just another branch of computer oh, forensics now. Back to Conti. The other thing that concerned me about Conti was they're looking at Intel ME vulnerabilities in the firmware, which was Oh, that's started, why. We were talking about that well, earlier. Yeah. Because yeah, it's, well, it's, cause it's it, built into many I, I think I, I think I read that before I started at Eclipsium and like I read the whole report and I was like, that's actually kind of frightening. And that's what got me thinking about Intel ME. And then <laughs> Oh my God, that's a whole rabbit hole. <laughs> yeah, I mean that—that's built into most of the kits now. Most of the ransomware games gangs have some form of boot kit and or wiper capability uh, for leveraging in those circumstances that you know make sense and or have a political gain or uh, for extortion that doesn't work out. So, uh, if you think that's kind of off in the future, no, those those kits are built that tooling is with inside of most of the, the ransomware capabilities. Scary stuff. I was also looking at EC firmware. I was like, what? Like I, I discovered my laptop is out of date and it's EC firmware. EC just stands for embedded controller. And in this case, it's a reference to your embedded <coughs> controller that largely is in laptops that controls stuff about your battery your keyboard, your touchpad. screen, touchpad, like those specific set of peripherals, right? Because like on Thing a laptop, you can hit function keys and adjust your screen brightness and your power button is yep. a key. So it's things that control hardware, the things that need like GPIO right. uh, input output for variables that are hardware or chip related, you know, like your webcam, your touchpad, TPM. Mm -hmm. uh, often you'll see it for light, like you said, lighting. Uh, integrated controllers for the the battery and refreshing the battery's memory. Mm. All of those things are embedded chips and, and controlled through IC via SPI. Right, and That's the charge controller everything. on the battery, which is always a fun one, because if you can screw with the charge controller, you can overvolt the battery. Or, I mean, what a great place for a keyboard sniffer, <laughs> keyboard keystroke logger. <laughs> yep. I haven't started researching attacks. I was like, wait, my, I need to update this on my laptop. And then you start going on a rabbit hole like, wait, I run Linux and I can't do that from my manufacturer via Linux. I don't know how many, if some manufacturers might, I mean, sort of if it's open source uh, firmware and you bought an op uh, a Linux based laptop, it might be, but you know, this is now uh, manufacturer specific and all the utilities are supported on Windows, not on Linux. So it, it tends to be a, a huge rabbit hole that I'm going down. It's a lot of fun. Cool stuff. Sam, um, what's one thing that you wish your students would do that they don't? Oh. Well, one thing is they're all afraid of mathematics, and I often have to get them over that. Mm. Um, they've all been traumatized by bad math class in fourth grade, and I have to say, you know, go back and look at it. It's not that hard. <laughs> so a lot of them are afraid of programming, too. And I say, you know, in both cases, it's the same. It's just taught badly. It's mm. if you can count on your fingers, you can do math. You just have to do one step and practice it till you have it, and then do one more step and practice till you have it. So that's all. I don't think they should be. Uh, I'd like them to get over these phobias. Yeah, I agree. And but you're saying we have these phobias because of bad bad teaching. Oh, definitely for mathematics. I know exactly why it happens. I used to teach Cisco, mm -hmm. and in Cisco. The mathematical peak of the course is subnetting, as you know. Yep, yep. And 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 the the way the Cisco curriculum is written, you're supposed to teach it in one night. You take them from not knowing binary up through subnetting. And the result of this is nobody gets it. Mm -hmm. Everybody's frustrated, and they spend the entire rest of the semester struggling to learn it. Mm -hmm. And I threw that away after teaching it that way, and I switched it to a five-minute lesson every week. Mm -hmm. The first lesson is nothing but nibbles. All you're going to do is take four bits and turn it to base 10 and learn how that works and mm -hmm. practice till you got it. And that's it. Then next week you do bytes. Then next week you do hexadecimal and cutting about seven or eight pieces. 
by the end of eight weeks, subheading is easy. God. And when I get to that chapter, half the students don't even show up because they already know it. I wish you were my teacher because I think oh, even, say, that's so even much when I was learning this programming, though, it was like one week. Okay, we're yeah. going to learn about all the different numbers. So you're going to learn binary, you can learn hexadecimal, and you're going to learn I know, all this you stuff. Gotta, and then there's going to the be a test is, on the end of the week. <laughs> and like, this why? is true of all math. Math yeah. is like building a, a, a house out of blocks. Mm. You have to have the first block, and then you have to put the second block on, and the next block, and they have to all be level, or it's going to fall down. Right. So you have to cover the first step, and then practice the first step until you've really got it. And then yes. go to the second step. Yes. I, I, I think... In my experiences over my life, I've overcome that like organically, just having to learn a bunch of the computer nerdy stuff. Now, when I go and help my kids with their math homework, and after helping them with their math homework for quite a number of years, I'm like, oh, I'm finally like not freaked out by a lot of this stuff, right? I know, and, and, and it's, 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 it's damage done to people by making them feel stupid by teaching it wrong, mm -hmm. and it's a shame. It's not necessary for them to feel that way. And this has got to do with that imposter syndrome thing that everybody always talks about. I mean, if you're in this business, the whole reason we're in it is this is an exciting business with new things every day. And that means that whatever you're doing, there is somebody a mile ahead of you doing stuff you can't even really understand that is more advanced than what you're doing. And there's right. no point being humiliated. You know, there's always somebody ahead of you wherever you are. But you, one thing I tell them is you will never stop feeling stupid. No matter how far you go, there will be somebody ahead of you. Right. And you just have to get over being upset about that. But there's like ways to explain things and explain things in different... I like breaking it down to shorter steps and then using e examples and understanding how different people learn. Like my son's a very hands-on learner. And so like sometimes when I was trying to explain math to him, I'd get a bunch of different fruit out on the table. <laughs> I'd use that because there was something he could, he could touch and place on the table. And like I felt like he just learned better doing it that way. Now, I, I couldn't do that for every example, but where I could, I thought the, the best kind of strides he made in learning was making it interactive and using analogies and hands-on stuff. Yeah, you got to meet them where they're at. One of the things I remember, my mother was a philosopher and very into abstract math, and she tried to teach me about the imaginary number I when I was 11, mm -hmm. and I just couldn't understand it. I remember being reduced to tears because I could not understand how there could be a square root of minus one. But this was an interesting experience, you know. There's there's certain concepts that people are just not ready for, and you got to wait until later. Mm. Da, uh, d Sam, my dad is a mathematician and is, and teaches statistics and computer science as well as a, a PhD mechanical engineer. I'm nine years old, learning long division, and yeah. I go, Dad, I don't understand this. I'm having some trouble. And he goes, No problem. Sit down. What are you What are you doing? I'm like long division. He goes, I'm going to teach you integrals. It'll absolutely make you understand long division better. I was turned off of math for like 15 years. Uh, no, that's the thing. The problem with math is once you know it, it's easy. Yeah. But it's not easy when you're first learning it. So they say, no, no, it's easy. You should just be able to do it in a snap like me. And that's not fair. Right. The teacher couldn't now, do it the first time that way either. Cryptography is a hobby because I love looking at the math. It's beautiful math. Mm. Yeah, the math is, that's why I like, that's what I first liked about cryptocurrency. I sort of wrote off the whole thing because my financial experience was working on restitution for pyramid schemes. So I said, this stuff is all just pyramid schemes. I'm never going to have nothing, any, nothing to do with it. But then I saw Matthew Green was on the board of Zcash, a real cryptographer. And I said, well, you know, the financial side of it looks horrible, but the math is interesting. It's certainly impressive. Yeah, it's funding a whole lot of development in math. Mm, it's a way to bring money into uh, mathematic research. Right. That's amazing. Um, so, Sam, I know you mentioned your, your website is samsclass.info, and yeah. folks can uh, attend any of your Yeah, classes. anybody can attend, and I got a bunch of like CTFs just running. People can do any time and stuff. And anybody can go to any of my classes. They're just on Twitch. That's awesome. And, are, and they're all on YouTube, too, all my old lectures. So, you know, anybody can see this stuff. You can't beat the price. That's right. We're going we're gonna to have links in the show notes, I'm assuming, for all those. Yes. Okay. Sure. Sam, I just, have, Absolutely. I just have five silly questions. If you listen to the show, you probably know what's coming next. But you ready to play five questions with Security Weekly? I'll try it. Three words to describe yourself. 
Oh, gee. I'm not going to do well at this. I can already tell. Uh, serious and technical and uh, absent-minded. If you were <laughs> if you were a serial killer, what would be your weapon of choice, absent-minded professor? <laughs> I suppose a bomb. That's what they usually, that's what Ted Kaczynski used. I guess that's the logical one to use. If you were to book <laughs> about yourself, what would the title be? A Wandering Path. What is your favorite oh. hacker movie? I haven't really watched very many of them. Um... I think, oh, oh, Sneakers. The sneakers. one with Robert Redford. That was good. There you go. Choose two celebrities to be your parents. What's that? Uh, alive, dead, fictional, or otherwise. Choose two celebrities to be your parents. Oh, celebrities. Alive, dead, fictional, or otherwise. So we should change that word celebrities. I think that makes me think pop culture. We really need like a uh, person Famous. of interest. Famous person. <laughs> yeah, we, we loosen the rules on that. Well, I choose Spock for the man. I'm not sure, oh, sure about the woman. That's a good one. And that's a. I think that's the that's first time first. I've heard that one. Yeah, that's a first. I that like is that. the first time. Yeah. I like it. Um, I'm sh I'm having trouble thinking of the woman. Um, Counselor oh, Troy, AOC. how could you forget? Ooh, no, yes. no, probably AOC. AOC would make a good mother. There you go. Sam, thank you so much for appearing on Paul sure. Security Weekly. Okay, no glad to be here. Thank you. With that, we'll take a short break. Come back with the security news. Stay tuned. Thank <laughs> you.